<clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> having avoided testing this link for the last week, I think you've now, uh, we've now experienced uh, setting the land speed record in bringing up a new computer uh, system. And uh, it may even work through the briefing. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, where we are today and how we got here. Uh, and you'll find a few typos in these view graphs because I don't think my last update uh, traveled with the speed of light into this uh, briefing, but uh, bear with me if you would. I'd like to give a, basically a historical perspective up, bringing us up to uh, where we are today and then where we may go in the future with a couple of specific options. One, in my view, uh, very good and the other very bad. <clears throat> so let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, hang on a second. It keeps wanting to... Uh, my system keeps wanting to do, uh, uh, give me me, not the slide. Okay. Uh, can you bring that picture in closer to the screen so I can see it better, please? Uh, your screen, your screenshot. Uh, good. Okay, that's excellent. Good. Well, this is basically the beginning. <clears throat> of exoatmospheric tests and what proved to be the end of exoatmospheric nuclear tests as well. Uh, you've heard about this in other briefings. Uh, the main tests are the four tests in 1962 that the US conducted, the three tests that the Soviets conducted. Um, and even though we did not know the magnitude of the EMP signal at the time, and therefore a lot of the uh, data that was collected was completely off scale, including the first uh, view graph I looked or the first uh, actually Polaroid I looked at in 1962. Uh, there was some data that was on scale and uh, <clears throat> uh, the later data provided to us by the Russians after the end of the Cold War <clears throat> also uh, confirmed the, the evolution of our understanding of EMP. Next view graph, please. Uh, 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 this is basically the cover of a, a document that compiled all of the effects that were observed from the U.S. high altitude test series uh, in 62. And interestingly, it wasn't put together until 1983, uh, but it is about 12 pages long <clears throat> and summarizes many effects that were observed <clears throat> primarily in Hawaii, in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, uh, and primarily from starfish, since that was the only test that was above the horizon to the Hawaiian Islands. The rest largely exposed open sea. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing about this document, besides compiling uh, uh, many results that were observed, is that it was classified confidential restricted data until about three months ago. and. Uh, uh, I became increasingly concerned, the commission became concerned that there's a great deal of data available uh, to a very, very small number of people and not available to the people who need it. That is to say today, those people who uh, design, develop, install, test, operate, and maintain our critical national infrastructures. So <clears throat> we made a request for a classification review that, uh, and uh, we made two observations, that while this document was classified uh, confidential restricted data, uh, it wasn't restricted data. That is to say, it didn't have any nuclear weapons specific information in it, other than that, like the yields, which have been previously released. And it wasn't confidential. This material was all taken from open sources. And so it was declassified uh, after uh, DOE and DOD review. However, it has a distribution restriction on it, so you still can't get it unless you're uh, linked into the government or part of the government in some way, and I'll come back to that point. Next view graph, please. Uh, as I mentioned, the theory was wrong at the time the tests were done. Uh, this view graph talks about the uh, Conrad Longmire's insight into what was really happening, namely that EMP uh, is produced by what is the same as a really large phased array radiator in the sky that goes horizon to horizon with uh, 
uh, different strengths in different directions. Uh, Bill Karzis and Dick Ladder later elaborated the theory in, in, in a physical review article. And uh, Bill Radasky, George Baker, and others working uh, for uh, the Defense Nuclear Agency and the Air Force Weapons Lab further developed the theory and explored the variation in, in bomb parameters and altitude and location and so on associated with that. And to the degree we've been able to compare the theory with the data we have from high altitude tests, they're in agreement. And this is the E1 component I'm talking about here. That is to say the very fast, sharp uh, part of the EMP. Next view graph, please. Uh, <clears throat> the paradigm has shifted, and most people don't understand that. But during the Cold War, we were worried about EMP <clears throat> primarily as a precursor to strategic forces, <clears throat> excuse me, before uh, a all out Soviet nuclear attack. Uh, was launched against our homeland and destroyed our strategic retaliatory capability. Our Minuteman missiles in their silos, our bombers at their bases, and at least our nuclear submarines that were still in port. And it's still a question of how well they could find them if they were in the open ocean. Uh, but the idea was to, uh, to make those strategic systems and the command and control that operated them uh, sufficiently uh, robust and uh, survivable against EMP that the, that the Soviets could not pin down our forces with a very light attack, either launched by satellite or a submarine close offshore, uh, while they were uh, then launching a much larger attack to destroy the Soviet forces, the U.S. forces, uh, with, their, with their missiles, uh, and therefore uh, uh, nullify our ability to uh, provide strategic deterrence, <clears throat> uh, which was the basis of mutual assured destruction, which was at least our argument for stability through the Cold War. And to that extent, we hardened, we hardened a number of things. We hardened the NORAD Command Operations Center in Cheyenne Mountain. We hardened the Minuteman II and three missiles, the ground-based facilities for the Minuteman, ultimately aircraft, and we also uh, 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 hardened our strategic command and control systems and our national command authority links. And of course, the Takamo aircraft is probably the best example of that, and it's still flying uh, and still tested for EMP hardness today on a, on a periodic basis. Uh, next view graph, please. Uh, uh, we learned a lot while we were hardening systems some of it obvious, some not so. <clears throat> the first thing we learned is you can't tell how hard a system is by looking at it. Uh, you've, you've got to test it, <clears throat> monitor it, maintain it, protect it. Um, it's very easy to, uh, to counteract the effect of hardening. And if you don't test it periodically or have some way of monitoring how well you're doing, um, you will lose hardness over time. And we also learned that semiconductors are extremely susceptible to EMP, a pretty obvious point. But they're much more susceptible when they're powered than when they're uh, not powered. Because uh, uh, what happens is the EMP E1 signal breaks down the back bias junctions. The power supply then comes through and destroys the devices and blows pieces out of chips and so on. And if they're not powered, there isn't the uh, power supply to do that. You can still damage them, but it takes a, a higher level of stress. Uh, we also learned that anything can be an antenna, if it, uh, as long as it's a, a conductor. And uh, often conductors are linked to semiconductor devices, which makes them particularly susceptible. And we learned many more lessons over this time. A lot of that has been put together in a handbook, uh, which the DOD has. but. <clears throat> Uh, the, the best handbook is unavailable to the critical national infrastructure community. It's, uh, it's classified. Uh, <clears throat> so once again, uh, there's information, but it's not available where we really need it today. Okay, next view graph, please. Uh, uh, when the Cold War 
uh, ended uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, we stopped nuclear testing. Uh, the, so the Russians say they stopped nuclear testing, <coughs> and uh, uh, the uh, Department of Energy Nuclear Weapon Labs went from designing and testing nuclear weapons to <coughs> what they call us. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a uh, stockpile stewardship program uh, in which they uh, they use analytical methods to try to evaluate the reliability of the nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, that's a sizable program. The labs are still uh, being funded in the billion dollar per year level, at least three weapons labs. Uh, but unfortunately, the Defense Department did not have the, uh, the insight and intelligence to, uh, to create a, uh, a nuclear weapons effects stewardship program. And so over time, the Defense Nuclear Agency was absorbed into a new entity, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and the nuclear weapons effects research uh, uh, diminished. Uh, however, uh, the great bulk of US expertise in understanding, testing, simulating, uh, and protecting against nuclear weapons effects in general, and EMP in particular, is contained in the 60 years of experience that the uh, Defense Department has accumulated. Uh, next view graph, please. The, uh, 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 in calendar year 2000, uh, some members of Congress and others were concerned that EMP was being ignored about a decade after the end of the Cold War. And so the Fiscal Year 2001 Defense Authorization, the Floyd Spence Defense Act, uh, created a commission to, to go back and evaluate where we were uh, in the area of EMP and where we were going. Uh, 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 we did that and issued a report in 2004. Congress reestablished the commission in 2006. We issued a longer report in 2008. And, uh, uh, and then uh, Congress reestablished the commission once again in fiscal year 2016. Uh, and uh, 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 unfortunately, the Defense Department decided to, uh, uh, to uh, delay and dissemble, uh, uh, even though funds had been specifically appropriated for the commission. And it, it took a year of determined bureaucratic uh, uh, effort to, uh, uh, on the part of the commission to get the funding in place for its small <clears throat> staff of six, six experts. Uh, the commissions have all, the commissioners have always served uh, uh, pro bono and, uh, and to get the commission running again with a, with a small support contractor. At that point, we had seven months left out of our 19 month mandate. Nonetheless, we have now uh, about a dozen reports in, uh, in preparation. Actually, they've been prepared. They're now uh, 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 in the DOD for security review, waiting for that and then to be issued. So next few graph, please. So here's one of them, the cover of one of them, which is the, the sort of the summary report of the commission. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the one from 2004. Uh, that's the 2004 report. Next view graph. That's the 2008 report. And I'll show you the 2017 report the cover in a minute. Next view graph, please. That brings us to today. Uh, the, uh, today, uh, nuclear proliferation appears to be accelerating around the world. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> there are certainly more countries acquiring nuclear capability and have acquired it since the end of the Cold War. Russia is becoming increasingly hostile and rearming at an accelerating rate. Iran is developing ballistic missiles. Uh, ballistic missiles for military purposes really only have value 
with nuclear warheads. Uh, India and Pakistan are now nuclear states. And North Korea, while uh, probably the smallest, poorest country in the world, is hostile, irrational, and determined to acquire thermonuclear weapons with ballistic missile delivery systems. At the same time, EMP is more or less fading in people's memories. It's becoming, in my view, more of a mythology. Uh, the knowledge base is aging about a year per year. It's in people who worked in this uh, starting back in the uh, early 60s, uh, but uh, there are fewer and fewer of them. Uh, uh, at the same time, instant experts are appearing frequently, uh, people who think that they have an intuitive understanding of this without any knowledge of anything related to it, as far as I can tell, including things like useful things like physics and electrical engineering. And uh, much of the press is reporting errors as non-experts, including non-experts in the government, I've found, such places as the National Security Council. Next view graph, please. Next view graph. There. <clears throat> this was a gift from Kim Jong-un as part of a... Uh, uh, let's go back to that one. I think you jumped one. Back one view graph, please. There we go. Uh, this is uh, uh, a picture of, let's go back again, let's go forward now this time. Yeah, okay, see if you can stay on that one. Uh, this the, the large peanut there is his version of a thermonuclear device. Uh, our artists have put a, put a re-entry vehicle over it, but if you look on the wall behind it, <clears throat> in a not very clear drawing, there is that picture of a re-entry vehicle over, over this device. And another picture shows Kim Jong-un pushing this device into the re-entry vehicle. That's called hands-on leadership, I think. Uh, and he said uh, that, uh, 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 well, let me read the whole thing. The H-bomb, the explosive power of which is adjustable from tens of kilotons to hundreds of kilotons is a multifunctional thermonuclear nuke with great destructive power, which can be detonated even at high altitudes for a super powerful EMP attack according to strategic goals. So at least one world leader has been convinced that EMP is a problem. And uh, unfortunately, he's on the end of delivering it rather than trying to, uh, trying to survive it. Uh, next view graph, please. <clears throat> Today, <coughs> while we still have some concern about Russia, we also have a, a, a concern that didn't exist in the Cold War, and that is that, uh, that there's uh, the possibility that some small uh, power, like North, such as North Korea, with a very few nuclear weapons by at least U.S. and Russian standards, could nonetheless launch a devastating attack on the U.S., or its allies by detonating one of its nuclear devices at a high altitude over the country. Uh, uh, today, more so than, uh, uh, than in, the, in the distant past, digital control systems are ubiquitous. Things called SCADAs and other devices control almost everything in the critical national infrastructures, power, communications, and so on. U.S. power grids are essential for, the, for not only U.S. national survival, survival of the population, but also for our military power. Our military can't, can't function and project power without the uh, national U.S. power grids. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about the uh, uh, U.S. nuclear power reactors because uh, they require active cooling. Uh, for, uh, uh, for survival and to avoid meltdown, even if they're uh, shut down, uh, as do the uh, spent, uh, spent fuel ponds. And they also require a, a powered grid to start. You can't start these reactors in a black grid. 
So that one or a few nuclear bursts over the U.S. could have the effect of leading to the meltdown of our uh, nuclear reactor base and the uh, uh, fuel storage facilities, spent fuel storage facilities over the country, which would be a, a disaster of high order. Uh, furthermore, E3 that you've heard about can affect uh, and cause the destruction of large power transformers uh, if they're being powered at the time they're hit with E3, uh, and they take years to replace, even in small numbers. And other critical national infrastructures besides power, communications, financial, medical, food, waste, uh, water, etc., all depend um, on, uh, on the control systems that EMP can destroy. Next view graph, please. So the summary of today is I have two bullets. One is <clears throat> that the U.S. is dependent upon the restraint of North Korea and others for its survival. That is a very bad situation for the U.S. to be in and should be completely unacceptable to our, our leadership. And the second is that, uh, uh, as uh, Don Rumsfeld likes to say, weakness is provocative. And right now, we are weak in this area. Uh, next view graph, please. Uh, uh, as I've said, the DOD is the repository and the generator of our EMP protection technology. <clears throat> but unfortunately, it's still living in the Cold War, and at least in this part of it, and not sharing what it knows with the uh, with our critical national infrastructure designers, developers, builders, and operators. Now, some of those people are foreign nationals, <clears throat> but we have to make a reasoned judgment. Is it better to have a, a survivable national infrastructure and inform them as to uh, what EMP is and what needs to be done to protect against it, or is it better to keep it secret from them and therefore from our critical national infrastructure and therefore from our country? Unfortunately, it's the latter policy that's being pursued today, and that's a holdover from the last decade or so, and it is an idiotic policy. Uh, and there are at least two parts of the DOD that can address this. <clears throat> One is the acquisition side, and the, the focal point is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for, for uh, 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 nuclear, chemical, and biological programs, and the the uh, uh, current administration's uh, nominee for that office was sworn in yesterday, approximately a year after the election. There's been every effort to stall him getting there, and let's hope he can make some progress in this. And the other is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Security and uh, Homeland Defense and Global Security, and uh, um, that is also a member of the new administration. Uh, and it's under the policy shop, and it's su supposed to provide policy in this area, and as far as I can tell, has provided absolutely none to this point, but certainly needs to. That office in particular would be a good link between the, uh, uh, the critical national infrastructure and the Defense Department with the support of the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Programs. Next view graph, please. <clears throat> but here's part of the problem. <coughs> I showed you this before, but if you, uh, if you go back uh, to this, uh, this report uh, on the effects that were observed, you'll notice on the right-hand middle of the page, there's a distribution statement C, and it says, uh, distribution is authorized to U.S. government agencies and their contractors administrative and operational use uh, uh, September 12th when it was declassified. Other requests for this document shall be referred to the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and so on and so forth. In other words, there's a uh, good luck if you want to get this, if you're not part of the Defense Department or, or a contractor to the Defense Department. There is absolutely no reason this document should be in limited distribution and it should be widely available uh, there's nothing classified in it, and it's only uh, a bureaucratic uh, uh, efforts, not 
anything to do with the science and technology that makes this a limited distribution document. And I encourage you to file a freedom of information request to, uh, to obtain it. And perhaps the new leadership will also have a good effect in that area. <clears throat> Next view graph, please. Uh, here are uh, uh, the two reports that are now in security review inside the Defense Department uh, prepared. These are two of the dozen reports that the uh, EMP Commission has prepared in the seven months it had to operate. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the left, <coughs> excuse me, is the overall summary of our work, and that will also be followed by a chairman's report that's somewhat longer and goes into more detail. On the right is a, a recommended uh, E3 uh, report. This was done by Dr. Radaski. Uh, and uh, it has an interest of E3. The threat specification is another document classified by the Defense Department and should not be, in my view. Uh, so during the tenure of this commission, um, uh, uh, when uh, uh, Bill Radaski told me that the Russians had given us the data on E3 from their high altitude tests, uh, I asked him to use that data, the Russian data, to calculate the E3 that would occur over the US. You basically take the, the geomagnetic field perturbation from the nuclear test and the ground conductivity profiles uh, and the geomagnetic uh, uh, latitudes and put them together and you can calculate E3. And so he did that. So the report on the right gives an E3, which is calculated from the uh, Russian, actually it's from the Soviet uh, nuclear test data, which they gave us. Uh, and that's now in classification review. And I'm, I'm willing to bet uh, your audience even money that uh, the Defense Department tries to classify uh, that even though it's uh, Russian data and Maxwell's equations, uh, but, uh, but we'll see. If not, then we'll have a new value for E3, which is different from any that you've seen so far and based uh, entirely on the data from the Russian tests. Next view graph, please. This is the, this is the end. And uh, basically I said I would show you <clears throat> two paths going forward. One is what I call the slow, expensive way, <clears throat> which is to keep all the D Department of Defense's knowledge of EMP bottled up, um, either under classification or distribution restrictions. Uh, uh, <clears throat> allow the Department of Energy and the Department of Homeland Security to go back and force them to have to reinvent 60 years of Department of Defense experience in the development of EMP technology and that would defer developing and implementing technology to protect critical national infrastructures from <coughs> from somewhere between the next five years and forever. Or the fast, effective way, which is to work with the Department of Defense uh, to use and build on the technology that it has already developed at great expense to the American taxpayer. Uh, many billions of dollars, in fact, uh, 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 activating the, uh, the statutory and, and directive responsibilities of, uh, of both, particularly ASD and CB and ASD Homeland Defense and Global Security, and then use the resources of the Department of Energy, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, 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 along with the Department of Defense's knowledge and experience to develop and implement effective approaches for protecting critical national infrastructure. And by effective, I mean cost effective here as well. And do it in cooperation with the DOD and the public and private organizations that develop, build, install, and operate our infrastructures. I hope with the new leadership, we'll move to the latter course, but it remains to be seen. Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you have. Bill, can you can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, good. So, who would like to ask a question? Who? 
Who would like to ask a question? Thank you. My name is Jordan Kearns. I'm with the Foundation for Resilient Societies. You mentioned that the North Korean regime was irrational. And I was wondering if, uh, based on that, you put any uh, faith in nuclear deterrence, particularly the survivability of our submarines, and is that an effective deterrent or not against an EMP threat from North Korea? Unfortunately, I'm not a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a experienced student of abnormal psychology. And so uh, I'm not very good at predicting what goes on in uh, Kim Jong-un's head. But from what I see, I'm not very comforted by it. Uh, I, uh, I can remember reading things from both uh, uh, Adolf Hitler and from some of the uh, Japanese generals at the end of World War II saying, we're either going to fight to the last man, uh, and in the case of the Japanese, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if everybody in Japan died in a futile attempt to, uh, to win this war? Uh, I was amazed when I read that, uh, and uh, glad they didn't follow through on it. But uh, uh, I have no idea whether Kim Jong-un has a similar view. I know that uh, in part, at least I've been told by Korean uh, experts, that uh, uh, when his father was looking for a successor, he asked his generals, uh, 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 what will happen if we fight the US? And they said, we'll win. And he said, well, all right, but, but if, if we lose, what then? And the generals were very quiet. And uh, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un, the, the son, said, in that case, we will destroy the world because the world is not worth having without North Korea. Uh, I'm not very comforted by that attitude. So I'm not sure how well he is, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un is deterred. And I think it would be better to uh, stop him rather than count on deterrence to control him. Another question. Thank you. John Curry, New Jersey InfraGuard. You had mentioned the vulnerability of large power transformers. Um, and looking at the installed base, the age of some of these devices, do you know if there's been any strategic initiative to try and standardize on the design of LPTs and possibly even stockpile a small number of uh, uh, backup or replacement units? Uh, I'm not an expert in that area. I think there has been a small amount of work done in that in that uh, area. Uh, my impression is it's not comparable to the number of uh, those transformers that are in service. And I'm also told by people like Commissioner Earl Geldy, uh, a colleague of mine who was the chief engineer of the Bonneville Power Administration before he became the chief operating officer at the Department of Energy that uh, many of these transformers are specific purpose designed uh, for their function. So I don't know how interchangeable they are, but it seems uh, that having transformers in reserve uh, in general is a very good idea. And I would encourage that to be considered as one of the, uh, one of the possible courses we can follow. Dr. Graham, this is Congressman Roscoe Bartlett. I want to thank you very Hello, much Congressman for your Bartlett. service on, uh, on the commission. And I, want to, I have just one question. How confident are you, sir, that our country will appropriately address this threat? <laughs> well, well, first, let, let, let me uh, say uh, hello and, and greeting to you, Congressman Bartlett, more than anyone else, and possibly in cooperation with Dr. Peter Pryor and Peter Pry started the commission in the first place uh, now 17 years ago. So uh, uh, I, I'm both, both appreciative and resentful to your great efforts there. Uh, but, uh, I, I had no idea this would go on so long. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, my impression is that the Many people in government and out have decided the best way to address this issue <clears throat> is in, in view of the fact that it's such a large-scale issue involving so many 
parts of our of our country, our society, and our economy, the best thing to do is to uh, ignore it and uh, hope it'll hope it won't happen. I don't think that's a very good approach, but that is probably as close to a model of today as you can find. Uh, so if I use history as a guide, I'm not very uh, encouraged. Um, I hope the works of, of the people at this meeting and, and your colleagues uh, uh, will have a positive effect. Uh, at least this time the commission decided that it was going to try to get the word out there so people would understand what EMP was and understand that it was a threat. And I see some of that taking root in the press. And it, uh, the EMP concern does pop up once in a while, even though and was describing the, the North Korean threat, often ignore it, uh, uh, less and less as time goes on. I guess on the one hand, I'm more confident that this might be taken up as a national issue than I have been in the past. On the other hand, I'm still uh, certainly not convinced that's going to happen, and I think we need to keep pressing on it uh, in the future. So we have one last question from the media from the, his insight? Right, so there's a, a question from a gentleman, Corin Gray. Are you aware of any attempts to address the fact that the majority of our large transformers and generators are produced in a large part in Asia? And uh, Corwin is uh, coming in from the Oregon InfraGuard chapter. Dr. Graham. Uh, would you ask the question again, please? So. Yes, sir. The question is, are you aware of any attempts to address the fact that the majority of our large power transformers and generators are produced in Asia? Uh, I'm, I'm not expert in that area. Uh, uh, I would, I'd therefore, rather than say something that would be incomplete or possibly wrong, I would direct you to... Uh, to Dr. George Baker, who is on the uh, uh, senior staff of the EMP Commission, and others more familiar with transformers, to see what's been going on in the US to try to address that, and what's been going on with respect to uh, stockpiling or maintaining an in inventory of transformers. I think there are activities in that direction, but I'm not familiar enough with them to make a useful comment. Frank. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, it took a while to get started here, but uh, uh, I encourage you to continue your meeting and wish you all uh, Godspeed.